Um, so to start, I'm, I'm going to start off with something where we don't have any hands on or anything like that. It's just to give you an idea about one of the tools that you're actually going to be using in the background because I've already written the job submission scripts and everything for you, so you don't actually need to know too much about this tool, but it's useful to know that it's actually working for you today, for most of today. Um, so the tool is called uh, Lightweight Measurement 2. I don't know what the tool is for, really, to be honest. Uh, for us today, especially, it's a useful tool. It was designed originally to kind of work in the background on cluster systems and monitor jobs and their efficiencies and things like that. Um, but it gives us some useful information that we're going to use today a little bit. Um, it's called the Lightweight Measurement Module. It does very lightweight measurements on things. Um, in terms of usage, it's a very low learning curve. You need to set a few environment variables, and that's basically it. Uh, that'll be done for you today, so you don't really need, need, need to pay too much attention right now just to see the idea of what kind of output it gives you. Um, it doesn't require any recompilation of your executables, so it's one of these ones that happens at runtime. It inter intercepts calls at runtime and then kind of wraps them dynamically. Um, it has some simple and useful performance information uh, in terms of the MPI, OpenMP, and the I.O. as well, and those are the three things that we're going to cover this morning, so it suits our needs. It uh, has very light usage of resources. It doesn't really have any, any overhead on your runtime, or it shouldn't at least. Um, it's geared towards cluster-based systems because it, it, it utilizes the fact that typically an executable uh, loads shared libraries. And so when it tries to load those shared libraries, it intercepts those calls and wraps the commands and things like that. So that's, that's why, how it works. Uh, it does not enable detailed performance analysis. That's not really why it's there. We'll see on the next slide why. Um, it's basically springboard for other tools. It'll point you roughly in the right direction of where you should be looking at. Um, so basically, you have your application, you profile it somehow with, with LWM, and then it should indicate to you which kind of tool you should perhaps be looking at next, depending on what problem you see in there. Um, so yeah, it has some simple output that'll provide some guidance. So here's an example of some of the output that comes out. It'll tell you how much time you've been spending in MPI. In this case, it's a lot, 86%. Uh, it will divide that up into what kind of calls we're talking about, the peer-to-peer -peer calls, so uh, just to send and receive or something like that, the collective calls, then you can see that's where most of the time was spent here, and then there's the I.O. as well. Uh, it'll give you some, a little bit of information about your multi-threading performance, uh, so basically it'll know how many threads you're supposed to have, and uh, then it'll tell you what your effective thread count is. We'll see in a minute what that really means. Um, it also can access some of the hardware counters as well, so it will link against the, the Papi library and be able to access the hardware counters, so you can have an idea of your, your hit ratio on, on your cache levels and things like that. There's some information that you can get out of there, uh, which again is probably useful for, most useful for the OpenMP stuff. Um, so yeah, on the usage side, you don't need to recompile. Um, you just need to set a couple of environment variables. Um, this little bit of information is kind of specific to uh, an MPI in ULIC. Um, if you want to have a look exactly at what variables you need to set, you can take a look in the job scripts from today. And you'll see them inside. Um, yeah, so sort of exactly what you need to do depends on the MPI that you're actually using at the time. Basically, you need to set this LD preload, and somehow you need to get that environment variable into your MPI. Tell your MPI it exists. Um, for non-MPI applications, it's really easy. You just set the you set the environment variable and then it will just run. So what exactly does it output? It takes, um, it takes time slices, so it takes information at particular, at some interval. Um, it does that for every time slice. It captures the MPI calls, some of the hardware counters or whatever. And then afterwards, it captures all that information per time slice, so you can see how things develop over time. Uh, so you can read the, the time slice information with the L2F reader which is also included in the package. Uh, today, we're just going to focus on the summary information that it gives uh, at the end. And that one, we can ask it to output to the console, and that's what we're going to do today. So it, it can output files that you can read with some other utility, but we're just more or less interested in some basic information that it gives. Uh, the console summary is what we're going to look at. It's divided into a few parts. Um, yeah, the output changes depending on what's inside in your code. So if you use OpenMP, it'll, it'll give some information about your threads. Uh, if you use MPI, there'll be the MPI information. If you, yeah, that then depends on what you ask for too. If you ask for hardware counter information, of course that information will come out too. 
Uh, so yeah, the first part will give you some basic timings, and then you have the job ID, which actually you don't have unless you, you tell it explicitly what it is. Uh, it'll give you the wall clock time, obviously that's something we're interested in, and then the number of processes. So that's probably from your MPI. Um, the rest of the sections are all some profiling metrics for specific uses. So we'll, we'll see them when we come to them, basically. There's the MPI sections, OpenMP, and the I.O. On the MPI side, there's some information about the, the communications. It knows how much information you're sending in terms of the number of bytes. It can talk about the collective message sizes and the frequency of message calls. Uh, so it gives you some general guidance about how much message passing is going on in your code. Uh, yeah, the frequency is calculated using both active and inactive application execution time. So basically, if it's doing nothing, it still thinks of that as, a, as, a, as an amount of time. So that's included in its frequency as well. For the MPI communication, you can get these transfer rate values can be very high, and that's because sometimes you might have some kind of non-blocking communication or something. So basically, you would have a non-blocking MPI call. Say the data transfer would start at that time, but it's non-blocking, so you can go back to your code and do some computation. Then you have the wait call at the end, and that's when you're, that's also the end of the non-blocking call. So in between, you've done a big data transfer. It only counts the time that you were in the MPI, so here and here. And so your data transfer rate would actually be very high because this piece and this piece, considering the amount of data, would be a very large amount. So you get, so then you have a good. It can give you an indication of uh, how good your overlap of comp communication and computation is. Um, in terms of the multi-threading, the way it calculates this OMP effective threads is it looks at the number of threads that you have. Uh, the active time is basically how much time the thing is not being suspended. Um, and so basically the split time, so that the, the complete single thread time is the, for the base thread. Uh, so it goes from one side to the other. And uh, no. Uh, no, thank you. Um, so it goes from one thread to the other. It splits the thread. They do something. One of them gets suspended while it's waiting to go back. Uh, and they join at the end. So the total active time is these active times, and then less the suspended times, of course. Right? And then from that, then it can calculate an effective thread. All right? so, so you can say how many effective threads you have, given this is your whole execution time for the longest thread. Right? And so, so, so that will basically give you a, an indication of how good your OpenMP is. Uh, what it doesn't take into account, so the thing you have to be a little bit careful of is, is that it, we'll see this today actually, so maybe I won't go into too much, but basically if you had bad memory performance, the thread would still be active, even though it's looking for mem stuff from memory and things like that, so it would still be considered active. So it's not enough on its own to see these figures being close to each other. You also need to take into account that maybe you have cache problems, okay? But we'll do that today. Yeah. Yeah, so when, when you're interpreting the output, uh, we do have this cache information so we can know about our hit ratios. If you have problems there, the tools you probably want to look at are something like ThreadSpotter or Paravair. Uh, if your effective thread count is low, again, it's ThreadSpotter, Paravair, and Vampire. Um, none of those tools, unfortunately, we'll be doing today. The one we did yesterday for the MPI stuff, it would be Scalaska. Uh, for the CUDA stuff, you'd again have to go to Vampire and Paravair. Uh, if you have low transfer rates in the MPI, Scalaska can help you there again, okay? So basically, these are the kind of things you'd probably want to be looking at from the output, to, to looking at these various things, and then from there you would decide what tool to use next. So we're just going to use it to do um, kind of some benchmarking for our codes today. Uh, it'll give us some timing measurements, and it'll help us test our scalability a little bit. Um, we'll look at the OpenMP and the MPI and the I.O. That's the three things we're going to cover basically this morning. Uh, yeah, it'll give us... Basically, in the job outputs, because we have this console summary and we're going to submit jobs to the queue, we'll always have a record of the output so we can look back on things. So it'll give us access to all this information and we can look back on it based on the, from the job histories. Okay, and just a little thanks for Amir Shah. He's in Aachen, in, uh, close enough to Ulik, and he helped me out with this, these slides and this, and this preparing this in general. Uh, so that's all. I just wanted to tell you that that's that tool exists and we're actually going to be using it in the background today. You, won't, you don't need to know anything about the invariables, it's already built into the job scripts. Um, so if you really want to look, you can look inside the job scripts and then you'll see how you can actually use the tool.